Good evening. Welcome to our Collision Bible Study. It's Thursday, December 17th. I want to thank those of you that are loyal to these Bible studies. Uh, unfortunately, um, we don't get the viewership that we do with our with our daily devotions. Their devotions are more than half, or more than twice as many views as the Bible study. I remember when I was uh, a Christian, uh, early Christian, I, gosh, I loved Bible studies. I remember going to New Life Church. wasn't even I wasn't even attending that church, and I started going to a Bible study there in uh, men's Bible study. Went there for many years. Uh, good evening, John. Good evening, Ariana. Uh, so Bible study. Morning, evening, Grace. Bible studies have always been important to me, and I trust that and hope that they're important to you too. So let's get started. Let me open the prayer. Father, I uh, thank you for your word, uh, for the power that it has, for what it's done to my life. Uh, God, your word is what enabled me to do the ministry that I'm now doing. Uh, thank you for the love you gave me for your word. And I pray, God, that you give that to others that are watching this tonight. An incredible love to learn more and more about your word. So teach us something again tonight. Amen. Uh, we're, we're in, in Acts, we're going through the book of Acts, a little different in Acts because a lot of it is stories that they tell. So uh, so I'm going to read quite a bit here tonight on a, good evening Rob, my name Paul, uh, on a story of uh, with Peter. Uh, remember we had just talked about Peter, how he had seen a vision and went to Cornelius' house who was a Gentile. And so the apostles had a hard time understanding this. Good evening Joanne says, the apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of an uncircumcised man and ate with them? Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as that had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision. I'm going to read quickly because you're familiar with the story. I saw something like a large sheet being led down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, eat, kill, and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in the house and say, Sent the Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message though you, through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them, as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift if he gave us who believed in Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Now we've talked about all of that stuff already. So what I want to talk about tonight is... The apostles didn't understand why Peter had done what he what he did, going to the Gentiles, going into their home, eating a meal with them. They were extremely critical of Peter. It wasn't until they heard the whole story that they accepted what he did and why he had done it. So what I want you to know is people won't always understand or even accept why you do certain things. You're going to do certain things, and people aren't going to know why you did it. Good evening, Anna. Uh, let me give you some for instances. I've lived in my house here for 40, 45 years. And when I first bought it 45 years ago, and I was a young family, and I was living in a little two-bed and one-bath house, and I bought this house, and, and the payments were 300 I think like $340 a month. But this is 45 years ago. And I can remember my brother saying, holy smoke, Jim, you're crazy. My father-in-law saying, what did you do? Then I started questioning myself, oh my goodness, am I going to be able to afford this 330 or whatever it was a month? Um, 
looking back now, looking back, they all realize that it was the best decision I could have made. In fact, I should have bought every house in the neighborhood. But at the time, they didn't understand. I was even questioning myself. Uh, I can remember when I was doing youth ministry for 10 years at, at Rosewood Church. And then all of a sudden, I stepped down to go into business with my son. And I can remember the youth, the, the, the youth that were in the youth groups, uh, the staff, the church was like puzzled, like, whoa, what is Jim doing? Leaving ministry to go do a, a hotels, renovate hotels? Uh, they didn't understand. I, I wasn't sure I was making the right decision. It wasn't until now that I understand why God did that in my life. I can look back now and see where it was the right decision. I, I, Tisha, my daughter, had two girls. She wanted a boy so bad. She had, I think, five or six miscarriages having the two girls. She wanted a boy so bad. And so they were trying again. And she had seven miscarriages. Seven. And finally, they decided that it just wasn't worth it anymore. It was ruining her body. It was ruining everything. So, But her husband talked her into trying one more time. And they end up having the boy, little James. What a precious little guy he is. Uh, uh, he's like a gift from God. Uh, but peeped, the rest of the family didn't understand why is she doing that? Why is she putting herself through that? They didn't understand. Now when they see little James, they realize, oh, wow, wow, how precious he is. So you see, we, we do things a lot of times that we, we don't understand and definitely others don't understand. And it isn't until it all works itself out that, they under, that, they, that they're able to understand but certainly not at the time. Uh, what were some of the things that you did that others didn't understand at the time? I bet you I can name some. I bet you who you married. I'll bet you who you were dating or who you're gonna get and who you married, where you were questioned by some people. Uh, having more children. The people with one child or two always question when someone has more children. Changing jobs. Some of you have changed jobs and you were questioned. Uh, quitting school. Maybe you went to college and you, could, and you quit school and started a business or something. I don't know. Uh, uh, changing college, going to college for one thing and then changing your major to something else. Um, who you dated. If you're young, who you date right now, you're being questioned. How you spend your money. People question, oh, I can't believe they got it. My gosh, they, 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 they went and got a new car. I can't believe they, now they got car payments. What are they thinking? Oh my goodness, I, they should have just rented. Now they went and got a house. My payment is so high, they're never going to be able to afford that payment. They're going to end up losing the house. People, people questioned you, didn't they? People always question, well, guess what? Jesus said and did many things that the apostles and others didn't understand at the time. Jesus was questioned many times. And we're going to go through some of these just so you can, if Jesus was, then who are we not to get to, not to be questioned? Uh, in Luke 2, 48, I'll set up the story. This is where, where, the, where Joseph and Mary took Jesus. They had to go to the temple once a year. And, and they were on their way back, and, and after three days, they realized that Jesus was nowhere to be found. And so it says here in, in verse 40, it started in verse 48. When his parents saw Jesus, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? Jesus asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. They, Jesus' parents didn't understand what Jesus was saying. He didn't understand why he would purposely abandon them for three. And it says Mary treasured it in her heart. Because later on, she would understand, but she certainly didn't understand at the time. Uh, look at verse 51. It says, and it is mother treasured all these things in her heart. Later on, understanding what, what, what he meant. In, in John, in John chapter 4. 
I'm going to read 31 through 33. It says, But meanwhile, the disciples urged Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. They didn't understand Jesus. They didn't under. They thought he was talking about food to eat. They couldn't understand where did he get that food from. It, again, it wasn't until until way later in their ministry that they understand what Jesus what Jesus was talking about. In John fourteen, I'm going to read verses one through eleven here. It says, Jesus said, "Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me." In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. He's talking to the disciples now. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me, that you may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That, that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been with you a long, such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not my own. Believe me, at least by the miracles themselves. They didn't understand Jesus. They didn't understand Jesus. It's like, show us the Father. Again, it wasn't until way later that they understood what Jesus was, what Jesus was talking about. Let me go back to Matthew. In Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23. Uh, Jesus is talking about his death now to the disciples. So from that time on, Jesus began to explain to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus. Never, Lord, he said. That shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. They didn't understand. Here's Jesus talking about dying and being raised from the dead. And, the, and here's Peter now saying that, you're, No, no, nobody's going to kill you. We're not going to let anybody kill you. We're, 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 we're with you. We're with you. We'll fight you to the bitter end. They had no clue. No clue what Jesus was talking about at the time. Luke 18. Thirty one through thirty four. Again, similar. Uh, let me just make sure I got the right one. Eighteen thirty one through thirty four. Okay. If anyone asks you, this is about, well, let me go. go. Go to the village, he told his disciples, ahead of you, and you enter, and you will find a coal tide there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. If anyone asks you why you're untying it, tell them, tell them the Lord needs it. It was a donkey. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the donkey, the owners asked them, why are you untying the donkey? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw the cloaks on the coat, and put it up and put Jesus on it. Uh, uh, again, di didn't have a clue. Didn't have a clue why Jesus was sending them to 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 get a a, a donkey. It was like, what what are, what are the, what what does Jesus need a a donkey for? Uh, then this one, Jesus took the twelve aside and told them. We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. 
the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them. They did not know what he was talking about. Many things Jesus did, many things that they had no clue, no clue what Jesus was talking about. Let me give just a couple more. Listen carefully to what I'm saying, Jesus said, to, about to tell them. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed in the hands of men. But they did not understand what, it, what this meant. It was hidden from sin, so they could not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. Jesus said so many things to them that at the time they didn't understand any of what he was talking about. Uh, coming, in, coming into, into Jerusalem on a, on a donkey. On a donkey. Uh, they expected him to be coming in on a royal horse or a carriage like other kings. Uh, not, not, not as a, not a, as a donkey. And, and even, even when you go further on, the crowd was chanted, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. They, 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 they were calling him a king. And here he is coming on a donkey. They had, they had no clue what he was doing or why he was doing it. And then finally in, in John 12, 16, it says this. At, at first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that all these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. It wasn't until, it wasn't until, wait after, it wasn't until, way after he was glorified. It wasn't until he was raised from the dead did they understand all these things. So, you're going to do things that people don't understand. Uh, you may not even understand why you do them. Let me just close here with, there's also things about us Christians that non-Christians, unbelievers, don't understand. And they're very critical of us uh, about it. Uh, things that they just don't understand. Uh, let me just give you a few in closing. Judging. They don't like that we judge their lifestyles that we judge their sexual habits, their sexual preferences, even their political views. Uh, they, they, they're, the unbelievers are very critical of us as, as being judgmental. And there's a saying, we can't judge them into a life change, but we can love them into a life change. And then they accuse us of being hypocritical. They expect us to be perfect, and they're quick to point out our faults. Uh, they see us in church on Sunday praising the Lord, but they saw us the night before, Saturday night, and, and, and at, at the party. Uh, they see us as being clicky, uh, only willing to associate with other Christians. This is so true. This is so true. Christians are very, uh, you know, some of you, some of you are certain nationalities. I know a lot of you watching this are, came from, from a Dutch background. And when you came from a Dutch background, you went to a Dutch church, you dated Dutch people, you married Dutch people, uh, you went to a Dutch school, uh, you, you, you're, you're, all your associates most likely were Dutch. Uh, other nationalities, the same thing. Uh, well, Christians are sometimes are that same way. We just hang around with Christians. But most of you that are watching this that are Christian, that are Christians, do you have unbelief in friends? Do you have friends that are not believers? Chances are no, no. You and, and we get and we and we're and non-Christians are critical of us for that, that. That we're not willing to associate with someone that's not a Christian, and it's important. Now it doesn't mean that we uh, that we marry them or that we have them as best friends or go into business with them. Second Corinthians is very points that out. Not not to not to do that with a non-Christian, but but we need to associate with non-Christians or we'll never reach anybody for the Lord. There was a pastor that uh, in a huge church and he uh, had a sailboat and he would use a sailboat for ministry and it took 12 men besides himself to, to, to run this big sailboat, especially when they raced it. He purposely, he purposely chose six Christians and six non-Christians to, to run the boat. It, with a purpose, with a purpose that, that six Christians would be influential to the six non-Christians and that with the possibility of reaching them for the Lord. Now, I, I commend that. I'm kind of like, wow, 
That, that is great. It's purposeful, purposeful ministry. So non-believers are critical of us that gee, all, they, all we hang around with is other Christians. And then the last one they accuse us of being closed-minded. This is a big one. They say we're closed-minded, that we think just only our religion and our beliefs are true and that all the other religions and beliefs are false, that only we get to go to heaven. Extremely critical of us. They don't understand what we understand. So they, and a lot of young people have gone off to college, to to colleges where they where they where they where they teach this and question why Christians would be so pompous as to think that only they get to go to heaven. What about the Muslims? What about the what about the Hindus? What about what about all of those other religions? I mean to tell me they don't get to go to heaven? Only you get to go to heaven? Very critical. They don't understand. They don't. We can't expect them to understand. So you're going to do things in your life that people are not going to understand. You've already done things in your life people don't understand. Jesus did things that people didn't understand. The apostles that are reading today, uh, Peter did things that the other apostles did not understand. Uh, Christians do things that non-Christians don't understand. That's just a part of life. And a lot of times it isn't until later on that they finally realize. So if an unbeliever thinks that you're closed-minded and only Christians go to heaven, and then you share the gospel with them, and their eyes are open and they give their life to the Lord, now they understand. Now they understand. It's our job as Christians to help them to understand that. That's why it's so important. I'm going to close it. So important to hang around with unbelievers to associate with unbelievers, and to strike up conversations, just, just casual conversations about things. And again, your, your faith is going to get tested. Your knowledge of Scripture is going to get tested because you're going to say something where they're going to question it, and, and, they, and they're going to expect an answer. That's why it says you be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is in you. When you hang around, if you hang around Christians, you're, you're, they may question why you're doing certain things, but they're not going to question your faith. You hang around with unbelievers, associate with unbelievers, and, and brain up conversations about your faith, about church, or about God. And boy, they're going to ask some really interesting questions, questions that you probably can't. I, I, as you know, I've, I've learned a lot about, this, about scriptures. I've studied a lot over, over my 40-some years as a Christian. But I still get asked questions by an unbeliever that I, I have to be honest, I, I can't answer you yet. I can't answer that. I'm going to have to do some really further study on that, but I, but I, but I can't answer that. Here's one of them that just got asked me recently. Remember this whole Black Lives Matter? Where where slave owners were really they're really critical and they were tearing down their statues, et cetera, et cetera. Well, one of them asked me, "What about in the Bible, in the Old Testament, maybe even the New Testament, there were slave owners? What did Jesus have to say about that? What did Jesus have to say about?" slave owners back at that time. And I'm like, uh... I, so it was like, whoa, what a great question. What a great question. I'd have to really, no, I knew some of the scriptures where, where God talks about, about if you're a slave, you're to, you're to do everything your master tells you. Uh, certain things like that. But... But it was like, what did Jesus really do? Did he condemn slave owners? Did he accept slave owners? Was that an accepted thing at the time? Good question. Good question, isn't it? I get asked, a, but that's how we grow. That's how we grow in knowledge when we bring up conversations and they give questions that we can't answer. My grandkids, my grand, Josephine, every once in a while throws a question up where I'm just kind of like, uh... Especially if it's something that I, I have to be careful how I answer it. But even a young child can answer a question that'll, that'll befuddle you. But it's important to do that. 
Yeah. What, what does Scripture say in Romans? How will they ever know if no one tells them? I mean, in Romans, how will they ever know if no one ever tells them? How will they ever know if no one ever gives them a chance to question? Christians need to be around unbelievers so that we can give them the answers that they're searching for. So thank you for joining tonight's Bible study. I love Bible studies. Gosh, I love Bible studies. I, I wish more, more people loved them. Um, uh, every time I study the Bible, every time I study, I learn more and more and more each time. Uh, I've read the, through the Bible many times. I've uh, I've did expository verse by verse studying the, several times every book in the New Testament, uh, and I still learn things. Still learn things. So, so can you, okay? Uh, I'm going to close with a prayer. Good, good evening, Patricia. Well, Pat Kemp's dead. Ooh, somebody I went to school with way back where I was just at in Langdon for my mom's funeral. Pat, you, you, by gosh, I can't believe, you, you just don't age. You just don't age. Uh, you look great. Uh, I'm going to close with a prayer. I just want to ask you to, uh, as you know, every every morning we have our daily devotions at 8 o'clock. I'll have one again tomorrow. And we're getting close to Christmas, so I got some special messages um, related to Christmas, but taking a little bit different uh, approach on it, okay? So uh, have a good night. Uh, if, you're, if this meant something to you, push that share button so we can get the word out to more and more people. Let me close with a prayer. Father, thank you as always for your word. Thank you for those that joined tonight. I, God, I pray they learned something. Um, I pray, God, that you, you you tell us that your word is powerful, that our faith grows from hearing your word. Uh, so I can imagine how much it will grow by studying your word. So I just pray, God, that their, their faith grew tonight as a result of watching this video. And uh, thank you, God, again for your word. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great night. If I missed uh, some of you, uh, Emma, thanks for joining us. Uh, God bless you all and have a great, great night.